Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. Uh, my name is Matt Graybaugh, and I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services Science Applications Program. I am our at-risk species coordinator for Arizona and New Mexico, as well as um, the federal co-director of CCAST. If CCAST is new to you, it's a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and production of decision support tools on key management challenges, such as introduced aquatic species uh, like fish that we're here to talk about today. We launched our non-native aquatic species community practice in May of 2020, coming up on two years now. Um, if this is new to you, um, we invite you to reach out to me or Christy by email, and I think uh, Christy will drop her emails in the chat if you'd like more information on the non-native aquatic species community practice. Also not fish related, uh, we're hosting a, a workshop starting next week on American bullfrog control, uh, which is a big tangent for me to go down, so I will resist. And just leave it to say, if you're interested in American bullfrog control in the West, uh, please reach out to me or Christy, and we can connect you for the workshop next week or give you some more information. And with that, I will stop talking, Christy, and hand it over to you. Well, thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Christy Miner. I'm the coordinator for the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice here at CCAS. Uh, webinars like this one today are one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today, we're very excited to host a presentation from Craig Walker, who will discuss a regional strategy to address illegal fish movement in the Colorado River watershed. Craig has worked for the Utah Division of Wildlife Resources for 20 years. His most recent position is as the Aquatic Section Assistant Chief over the Sport Fish Program. He oversees management, monitoring, and development of sport fishing opportunities across Utah with a focus on warm water fisheries. Just a final reminder before I turn it over to our presenter, if you have questions during the presentation, please just enter them into the chat box and I'll relay them to the speaker after the presentation. Uh, also, like Matt said, we might be able to open it up for discussion as well. And with that, Craig, I will hand it over to you. Christy, good morning. Uh, I am just gonna wave to you all and then I'm going to shut off my video because of my unstable internet connection. So, hi everyone. And everyone for just a second. As Christy mentioned, uh, I'll be uh, hosting a webinar today to talk a little bit about um, our efforts to curtail illegal sport fish and bait fish movement in the West and come up with a plan to do that. Um, it's been a, a two-year effort that was undertaken as part of a Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council subcommittee assembled to develop a region-wide plan to curtail the legal movement of sport fish and bait fish in the Western United States. During today's presentation, after providing you with a brief overview of that effort, um, I'm going to provide you with an overview of the draft plan itself, defining the problem of illegal stocking, outlining suggested prescriptions designed to address that problem, and illustrating a course version of the suggested timing for implementation of plan strategies. I'm then gonna present you with an update on where we are as a council, as far as finalization and implementation of the plan that I'm going to overview. The Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council is a WAFWA council made up of five Colorado River Basin states, Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming assembled to address basin-wide aquatic resource issues. Beginning in 2020, the council formed a subcommittee made up of representatives from all member states and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to discuss what an appropriate Western response to illegal fish movement should look like. I was charged with chairing that subcommittee. And beginning in 2020, the subcommittee developed a white paper on this issue recommending that development of a strategic plan be pursued. The council chiefs were presented with that white paper and agreed that the subcommittee should engage in the development of a regional strategic plan to address illegal fish movement. During the remainder of 2020 and 2021, subcommittee members convened multiple meetings to develop a strategic plan to curtail illegal sport fish and bait fish movement in the West. The plan was developed with four overarching goals in mind. 
first, to mitigate expansion of nuisance invasive fish populations. Second, to improve administrative and political support for a regional approach. Third, to increase regional consistency of proactive and reactive measures designed to curtail illegal fish movement. And finally, to increase public buy-in as efforts are made to stop illegal fish movement. As the subcommittee began to develop the plan, we realized that prior to addressing the illegal movement of sport fish and bait fish in the West, we first needed to define a problem, specifically looking at the roots of illegal stocking. The roots of illegal stocking can be traced to six sources that we could find. The sanctioned stocking of non-native species, ineffective outreach and education, inadequate application of penalties, inappropriate regulatory responses, failing to proactively meet the needs of anglers, and the lack of a regional approach to address the issue. Since 900, black management agencies have introduced 293 non-native fish species in the United States. The majority of those introductions occurred after 1950. Introduction of these species into councils, countless waters has provided anglers with readily accessible source populations which have allowed them to engage in illegal stocking. Additionally, the sanctioned stocking of fish by management agencies has given anglers the impression that stocking is kind of the magic bullet that leads to the establishment of successful fisheries. Sanctioned stocking remains an important management and conservation tool for us. However, use of stocking to establish new fish populations has waned since 1980. In many cases, the need for stocking has been reduced because management objectives have been achieved. In some cases, management, management agencies have exhausted their options for use of new species. But most importantly, the frequency of sanctioned stockings designed to establish new fish populations has declined because I think most of us know, fisheries professionals now have a greater understanding of the impacts of non-native introductions on native fish populations specifically. Another root cause for the occurrence of illegal movement is ineffective outreach. Anglers are in most cases unaware of the seriousness of this issue. Having viewed sanctioned stocking as a panacea in the realm of fisheries management, some anglers have adopted a mentality that illegal stocking is really no different than what we do on a day-to-day -day basis through sanctioned stocking as fisheries professionals. Without effective angler outreach and education, fisheries professionals have been unable to counter this perception. Currently, most anglers in Utah believe that naturalized non-native fish species are actually native fishes. In Maryland, 69% of anglers release their unused bait fish. According to a study conducted in the Midwest and Canada, 71% of anglers who release fish do so because they believe their actions are actually benefiting fish populations. All of these misperceptions and behaviors highlight the need for more effective outreach on this and other fisheries issues. A third underlying cause for the prevalence of illegal fish movement is the inadequate application of deterrence. Although license revocation and costly restitution penalties are available for use by many state wildlife management agencies, such penalties are rarely applied to illegal fish movement violations. Most times, misdemeanors are used when addressing illegal fish movement violations. When we limit the fish movement violations to misdemeanors, however, it really minimizes the seriousness of this issue in the, this issue in the eyes of anglers and the legal system. Detecting violations also remains difficult, which combined with our limited ability to enforce this with uh, more stringent violations, um, it makes it difficult to impose these penalties. A fourth root cause of the illegal fish movement problem emanates from inappropriate regulatory response. In many instances, fisheries managers choose to manage illegally stocked fish populations. While successful in some instances, managing illegally introduced species serves as a reward to the perpetrators of illegal fish movement. Similarly, managers sometimes pursue regulation to actually benefit the anglers seeking to catch illegally introduced species. For example, 
managers employing a catch and kill regulation on illegally established population of yellow perch are likely actually rewarding harvest orient harvest oriented anglers who engaged in the illicit activity in the first place. Engaging in an inappropriate regulatory response will likely encourage additional efforts to establish new fish populations illegally. Failing to meet the needs of anglers proactively is yet another root cause for the prevalence of illegal fish movement. As you mentioned earlier, some anglers believe that by stocking fish, they will be able to achieve the same outcomes as fisheries managers. These anglers actually believe they are providing a valuable service, meeting the unmet needs of an angling public by creating local access to desired fishing opportunities. In their minds, they're filling the gaps left by fisheries managers who have not investigated safe ways to proactively establish convenient access to desired angling opportunities. Probably the most important underlying cause for the persistence of illegal fish stocking in the West is the lack of a concerted regional approach. The interstate effort to curtail illegal fish stocking in the West will only be as strong as the weakest link, meaning a state whose responses are the most ineffective or are inconsistent with others at a regional scale might actually limit the entire regional effort. It should be noted that inconsistent approaches undertaken at a state scale will also hamper the success of efforts to curtail illegal fish movement within that particular state. Regardless of the scale of the inconsistencies, it is likely that illegal action will emanate from those areas having the most lenient and ineffective policies. Scope of the problem is, is bigger than the problem of illegal stocking is pervasive, right? We know that. However, the number of stocking attempts and number of fish moved during each attempt, what we as biologists term propagule pressure, has got to be considerable in most instances for a fish population to successfully establish. Therefore, given the number of successful illegal stocking efforts observed, it suggests that attempts to move fish illegally are likely more common than we previously thought. So now on to our effort to develop a strategic plan. During the, the development of that strategic plan, to curtail illegal movement of sport fish and bait fish in the West, our subcommittee identified several strategic approaches designed to address the illegal stocking problem. The first of these is the development and consistent implementation of outreach and education campaigns. We suggested that such efforts not only be focused on anglers and the general public, but also decision makers. We also suggested that this work be performed in concert with the Aquatic Nuisance Test Western Regional Panel, and or a private marketing firm. During any campaign, the subcommittee strongly suggested that messages highlight the direct personal and social benefits for targeted audiences, focusing on revenue increases, tourism dollars, and increased ability to implement critical management and conservation actions. To effective messaging, the subcommittee suggested that data necessary to assess the strategic success of an illegal fish movement control effort be collected and stored in a regional geodatabase. The information that we're talking about would include, but not be limited to, documented sanctioned and illegal fish introductions, management and regulatory responses to illegal introductions, and penalties imposed for violations. We also suggested working with the USGS non-indigenous aquatic species database team or a willing single state to develop and manage such an app. Although outlet screens and sterile fish species are already being used strategically to mitigate escapement from lenthic systems by some states, the subcommittee suggested that sterile fish needs in the West be inventoried and prioritized during future subcommittee or Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council meetings. We also suggested that this information be incorporated in the aforementioned geodatabase to allow for assessment of these escapement mitigation strategies as they are implemented, excuse, implemented, excuse me. Another suggested strategic approach addresses laws pertaining to illegal fish movement and the enforcement of those laws. 
During development of this plan, information related to legal deterrence was collected from five Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council states. However, information from remaining WAFWA states will be critical to the development of a suite of legal deterrent best management practices by the committee. We suggested that these best management practices be developed in a manner that addresses the diverse legal realities of WAFWA states, allowing states to choose from the list of prescribed actions as needed or possible. Yet another strategic approach deals with the regulatory management responses. Similar to law enforcement, the law enforcement element of the plan, the suggested course of action involves inventorying existing management and regulatory responses to detected illegal introductions in the West. Once these data gaps are filled, a suite of best management practices will be developed by the subcommittee. These best management practices will avoid the no action approach and set the stage for a development of a water specific or statewide early detection and rapid response plan, analogous to those in place for containment of detected populations of dracinid mussels. The proactive assessment of angler needs is a critical strategy suggested in the plan. This assessment would involve the implementation of angler surveys by Willing, Wafla, and Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council states using a standardized template to assess behaviors, preferences, motivations, willingness to travel, and other human dimensions data. These data can then be harnessed to create convenient access to desired fishing opportunities where possible. The subcommittee also suggested that water specific management teams be assembled to develop and dive water specific fisheries management plans that incorporate human dimensions data gathered at a statewide or regional scale. The plan that the subcommittee envisioned is by no means static. We suggested that the subcommittee review of the plan be conducted regularly, that these reviews allow for assessment of plan success and identify possible plan modifications. Reports on the success of efforts to curtail illegal fish movement and or suggested plan modifications could then pre be presented to an oversight body, such as WAFWA, the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council, Western Regional Panel, et cetera, for further scrutiny or approval. The most important strategic approach identified by the subcommittee in this plan was continued collaboration to address the illegal fish stocking on a regional scale. The strategic collaborative regional approach in eight sets the stage for greater consistency needed to more effectively address illegal fish movement in the West. However, maintaining such consistency through continued strategic collaboration is likely going to require some sort of regional oversight. The subcommittee therefore recommended that the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force Western Regional Panel be approached regarding their willingness to oversee the regional effort to curtail illegal sport fish and bait fish movement and stocking. In the event that the WRP is unable or unwilling to oversee the effort, we suggested the creation of a formal multi-state, multi-partner body to undertake oversight. Whatever that oversight body ends up being, the subcommittee suggested that group membership not be confined to fisheries and AIS professionals. We suggested that an effective leadership structure include non-traditional partners involved in angling, for example, uh, BASS, uh, Bass Angler Sportsman Society, water management, outdoor recreation interests like Cabela's, um, expansion of committee membership to those non-traditional partners. We set the stage for increased public awareness and would likely broaden advocacy for pre prevention of illegal fish movement. Our vision was that under the guidance of the oversight group, the region-wide plan could serve as a guiding document for the development and implementation of state-specific plans and actions that conform to what we know to be the political and regulatory realities that differ between specific jurisdictions. The strategies outlined in the plan are designed to be implemented between 2021 and 2030. Beginning in winter 2021, the subcommittee suggested that progress be made toward development of an outreach and education toolkit of sorts. Then during summer of 2022, we suggested that state partners begin to engage stakeholders in their respective states to set the stage for buy-in during future implementation phases. In summer of 2022, we suggested that efforts to fill data gaps also be started. 
Additionally, in summer 2022, the subcommittee suggested that states begin to work with subcommittee, work with subcommittee to develop prioritized a prioritized list of lentic screening and sterile fish needs and begin working with the oversight body to develop uh, a rapid response template. During winter of 2023, we suggested that states work with the subcommittee to begin assembling enforcement data and start the process of best man practice. Then in summer of 2024, we suggested that states begin to implement strategic plan recommendations using state-specific plans. Finally, assuming that most of the state-specific plans are developed and underway, we suggested that the oversight group kind of shift tack and investigate the expansion of this effort to be inclusive of ornamental fishes, which was a contentious issue during uh, development of the sideboards for this particular plan. Um, this would likely happen through the development of a unique and separate plan, however. So where are we right now on the development of this plan and the status? Uh, during December, 2021, the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council met with the subcommittee and the subcommittee presented the information you've seen today to the council and asked the council chiefs to develop a resolution that would encourage WAFWA states to follow through on plan elements and secure greater westwide cooperation on this issue. However, council chiefs did not respond favorably to this request for several reasons, and they're justified. Generally speaking, the scope of plan objectives were viewed as too expansive, somewhat infeasible, and insufficiently flexible. Additionally, council states perceived some descriptions of shortcomings related to historical responses to illegal fish movement as maybe unnecessarily accusatorial, uh, kind of a finger pointing. In response to council concerns, the subcommittee agreed to modify the plan to increase usability by Western states and represent the document to the council at a later date. During the December 2021 meeting, council chiefs agreed to be more hands on with this effort to avoid further subcommittee efforts that resulted in a product that was viewed as possibly impractical from an implementation standpoint. Since that December meeting, the subcommittee has reconvened four times to discuss future engagement with the council to develop a more effective game plan for plan revision. Additionally, we've conducted a critical review of the plan language, creating a red line version of the plan. And in the coming months, uh, starting in May, the subcommittee will sit down with the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council chiefs to review uh, survey results that we, uh, we sent a survey out to the council itself, re review those results and those opinions that came back related to prioritization and inclusion of plan objectives and get some additional direction from the chiefs as to where we want to head on this. Um, in the end, the subcommittee is attempting to avoid investing considerable time and effort, which went into the first draft of the document, writing a plan that will not be used uh, and will not meet the needs of member states within the council or within WAFLA. So that's where we are right now on the effort to successfully curtail illegal sport fish and bait fish movement. Today, I'd like to leave you with a few takeaways based upon my experience. Um, and these are more generally applied to collaborative efforts at a regional scale. Uh, personal and administrative realities vary greatly among states and partners. And we need to address these when we're conducting uh, efforts that are similar to what I described today, uh, region-wide planning efforts. Second, uh, don't rush things. Take the additional time you need to work through the problem thoroughly and allow for all opinions to be expressed and addressed early on in a process. And, uh, you know, that, that is a skill in and of itself to make sure you wheedle out all of those thoughts from um, folks at the table. Uh, and if we don't do that, uh, we're gonna end up with some pushback in the home stretch that can derail some efforts. Uh, this is a, a good way to avoid that. 
Similarly, make sure your perception of achieved consensus is not just wishful thinking. I think when we, at the outset of this process, uh, within the Colorado, Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council, within WAFWA, within the subcommittee, we all thought that we were on the same page. Uh, technically, we are not on the same page, and that's why we're uh, delaying the publication of this plan um, and the follow through on the plan right now uh, and why it's under further review. I think if you reach consensus too quickly, uh, question the val validity of that outcome before forging ahead. Um, when you're dealing with contentious issues, it should be difficult to reach consensus. It's easy to remember too, Content contentious and consensus, they rhyme. Um, Lastly, don't give up. Uh, you, you know, more and more in this profession, uh, when I started out early in my career, I always had the grand idea that I was going to lead some effort that was going to result in some magical outcome that I had, you know, hung my hat on and could make my career bones on. And um, these days, the issues are so complex that, to be honest, it's, it's more of a baton handoff than anything else. You're not in all likelihood, give me the one that derives the solution to complex problems. However, remember that your efforts are going to likely establish the foundation for an eventual success. And with that, I'd like to uh, give some special thanks to my fellow, fellow Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council subcommittee members for all of their virtual hours and input on this plan. Andy Clark and Kate Stiegler with Arizona Game and Fish, Lori Martin, uh, the Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Eric Fry, New Mexico Game and Fish Department, Craig Amadio, Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and Kevin Johnson and Kevin Maccabee. I think Kevin Maccabee is on the call today uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, they were instrumental in getting this to where it is today. And with that, uh, hopefully there's some questions in the chat. I'd like to thank you all for your attention today, and I'll field those questions as they come up. Thanks. Awesome, thank you so much, Craig. Um, that was a great presentation and really interesting work that you've got going on. Um, we do have just a couple questions here, but as, you know, as I'm relaying these, feel free to put more in the chat and we might be able to um, open up some conversation as well um, outside of the chat. Um, so Craig, the first question um, says, I noticed that throughout the presentation, you included photos of both native and introduced fish. Do you see education on native fishes as an important aspect of public outreach? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, we have got to get our general public through outreach efforts and our decision makers and administrators to gain a better appreciation for our native species um, and the value that they hold uh, intrinsically um, and the potential impact that sport fishing uh, can pose to the conservation of those native fishes. And I think I, round tail were showcased in the presentation a couple of times um, one of the reasons why we're putting that in there is because we're following suit on some other states' efforts by actually moving forward with an effort to uh, retool them, uh, I guess, as a as a sport fish, reclassify them as a sport fish. And our feeling is that by species as sport fish, uh, we're going to gain a greater appreciation for that particular species, um, but also the environments and the assemblages that are, are associated with a particular species that we have reclassified as a sport fish. So long, long and short of it is absolutely yes. Uh, we are trying to kind of blend our outreach messages to uh, not only address the sport fishing community, but address the community of Utahns at large. Excellent. Um, Christy, is it okay to jump on for a second? Go for it. Sure. Okay. Um, and Craig, this is maybe a partially an unfair question for you, but um, I spent a lot of time on the 
on the Fish AZ Facebook page, which is an angler group on Facebook in Arizona. Um, and it always catches my eye when there's discussion on ang angling of native fish. So native fish is sport fish. So that's kind of par partially where my question came from. And I'm just curious, I know we have some other state wildlife agency folks on here, like if promoting native fish as sport fish is something that could be part of that outreach. And again, we don't need to go there too far, but that was part of the context of my question. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's a great idea. Um, and it is the way that we begin to, you know, take the siloed aspect of not only fisheries management, fisheries conservation, uh, fish recovery, uh, but also the, the perceptions of our general public and bring them together. Um, you know, when you start to divide things into this is a trash fish, this is a, a fish of value, this is this, this is that, um, we, we struggle. We struggle professionally and we struggle as far as our public perception and the support for um, the, the particular species, but also for the habitats that they inhabit. Um, you know, the last thing I'd like to see with dwindling water in the state is for us to uh, conserve water in our high and mid-elevation streams and reservoirs at the cost of low gradient, low elevation rivers um, and terminal waters. And, you know, if we don't start getting political support, public support for native species as something of value, that's potentially what's going to happen. So it's, a, it's part of a broader issue for sure. I appreciate that. Thanks, Greg. Awesome. And we have uh, one more question in the chat right now. Um, essentially says, how do you deal with the urgency of the non-native issue when the conservation of so many native fish species is at risk? Um, we had some interesting opinions that were expressed early during this process when before we even convened the subcommittee. Um, those were in this vein. Why the rush? These are around forever. Why the urgency now? And I think what we've noticed is that, you know, invasive species in, in a system like for for example, the Colorado system, right, have been there forever. You've been invasives in that system for a long time, but they don't start to actually become impactful until we see degradation of the habitats, right? The loss of water, the loss of floodplain habitat, whatever it is. Based on the horizon, that makes the urgency greater. Um, the situation with the habitat quality out there, the availability of habitat, refugia, um, is dwindling. And if we don't get out ahead of this right now, we're going to see this, this impact. That was my response to them saying, why the urgency? So I think I convinced some people, I hope. <laughs> Um, let's maybe, that's all we have in the chat right now, but if anyone wants to just unmute or raise your hand, we can have some open discussion as well. We've got some time. So yeah, just, just, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and I'm, I'm seeing Julie's response, uh, to David. And I, I think that, you know, Julie's right. And I, I, I hope I didn't belittle you know, the, the validity of the pushback that we got from the Colorado River Fish and Wildlife Council chiefs on this issue. Um, it was an idealistic plan uh, as written, and it did not really address to the degree needed uh, the political realities that do exist. And, you know, again, that's where, yes, everybody is tacitly on board with this, for sure. Everybody agrees that it's an issue. But the devil's in the details. How do you get there when one of your major objectives is dealing with law enforcement related issues when our law enforcement 
across five states, let alone all the WAFWA states, is just all over the road as far as their capabilities to enforce certain violations because of the political differences that we have with states' rights. So um, what we're shooting for as we move forward, again, working with the council chiefs, is to come up with a pared down list of objectives that still get at the heart of the matter. One of them I think that everybody can probably agree is doable, is that an outreach component and adult learning component that we have been so successful with in the aquatic nuisance species realm for dracinid mussels. Uh, moving forward with something similar in the realm of illegal transport and stalking. You know, like I highlighted in the presentation, our constituency, the bad actors, think they're doing a good thing when they do this. I mean, they think they are performing conservation actions of establishing northern pike populations that are fishable. No, you're not. And we've got to get that message out to them and make that next generation of anglers realize that if you have an issue with how things are managed, let us know and we will address it proactively. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that was, to me, that was a super interesting finding that people were quote unquote helping. <laughs> oh yeah, they're, everybody's a helper. <laughs> awesome. Other questions for Craig? Matt, do you want to jump in? If I can find the right button, uh, me again. Um, yeah, and I'll show my naivety through this question, and I'm good with that. I'm used to it. Um, yeah, so I'll say, you know, first, this Colorado Fishes Council is somehow new to me, which is not a surprise because I'm fairly new in this. Um, but I am curious, you know, in part of the discussion tool, Julie, of how, well, let me try this a different way. If this committee came up with recommendations, associated with this. I'm curious how they would then trickle down to state regulations or state laws. Like, And Arizona Game and Fish's uh, fishing regulations, I know there are restrictions on bait fish stuff. Um, I don't know what the penalties are. I haven't had to find out, thankfully. But um, anyway, I'll stop talking. I'm curious how this type of plan, how you would see this type of plan trickling down to state regulations and state laws. Um, small question here for just I don't know if somebody could chime in with that. I'll throw it over to Julie. Okay. <laughs> or John. John would have a good idea too. <laughs> John's on here too. Can y'all hear me? Yep, you sound good. Yes. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, for, so several years ago, just to get out the bait fish thing in particular, um, I think about seven or eight years ago, we had a, an internal team that evaluated our use of live bait species. Um, and we made recommendations and <clears throat> there, we've been working through those recommendations uh, annually. And it also takes time getting at what I had responded to David with legal things. Those all involve rules and those work through our governor's offices to make rule changes for the most part. And then those are reflected in our fishing regulations. And so uh, for instance, our rules, uh, they we do a review every, I think five years. And so we have to wait for those cycles to come around to propose rule changes and whatnot. Um, for bait fish, live bait fish, we've been, we've been getting rid of species um, every, for the last two rule reviews, we've dropped species um, and we're going to make a big push during the current rule review right now to further reduce the number of bait fish species. And then that can be reflected in our regulations. And for you, Matt, like, unfortunately, our penalties are really um, not our penalties are not great. Uh, they're pretty small for illegal fish movement. That's something that we definitely want to address. And that is a whole separate, that's another rule process. But when you, when it involves actual like fines or, you know, it's a different classes of misdemeanor or felony, that's a whole nother level of uh, com complexity, I guess. 
Um, not to say that we aren't going there, it's just, it can't be done overnight. And so our recommendations for the subcommittee were to look at a phased approach uh, because it was overwhelming um, at first and all of the recommendations were fantastic. And it was just, we can't do them all at once. And, and some of them have to be systematic and really start with um, the outreach and education piece. So that that's what I'll say. And I don't know if, if uh, John has any anything to add also. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Julie. I'll jump in just real briefly uh, since you put me on the spot. Uh, um, but this is really, it's a game of whack-a-mole to try to, to run this down because, you know, in Nevada and we're outside of the project area specifically that um, Greg was talking about, but with the same issues internal to the state, we've significantly over the past several regulation cycles tried to tighten up and where possible eliminate um, or much more highly restrict live bait usage. The problem you then run into is, you know, two prong. One is enforcement because quite honestly, with the limited conservation law enforcement presence out there, they're going to prioritize and it's hard to make this a priority. And then when they do cite someone, at least in Nevada, it goes at misdemeanor level to individual justice of the peace who don't understand the problem and don't impose useful or significant penalties. So maybe that's another aspect is that this, this education goes beyond just anglers, the need for that outreach and education. It's to try to make other parts of the system, particularly in the legal enforcement and all the way from game wardens to justice of the peace courts to understand the significance of this problem and why it needs to be addressed. So it's multifaceted and you fix one thing, but that doesn't guarantee an outcome somewhere else. And that's part of the problem. Yeah. And I, as I mentioned, this to me is, is so analogous to the aquatic nuisance species effort that was undertaken for descended mussels. And you look at where we are, you know, a dozen years into a concerted region wide effort to try and address this issue through adult learning and outreach and changing of laws and all those types of things. Um, it's, it's a heavy lift and it's, it's an ongoing effort. Um, but, you know, we're, we're attempting to start it. Um, and as both John and Julie mentioned, it's by no means simple. Um, but I think having the conversation with lawmakers first and foremost, with decision makers first and foremost, in the same way we did when beginning our descended muscle efforts, uh, showcasing the cost to the state um, it, it is critical. Uh, when we look at how much money we invest in the removal of invasive species, illegally introduced species, whether that be through rote known treatments, mechanical removal, all that, in and of itself, that is a huge cost. We're not even talking about the potential impacts to tourism and fishing opportunities and established fisheries where the introduction of one species into an existing assemblage can throw it off kilter. Um, so, you know, the audiences are, are many. We just need to do, uh, I'll call it in-reach, I guess. It's not really a public outreach effort. It's more of a making sure that our administrators and decision makers are aware of the, the breadth of the problem, the impact of the problem, and the economic cost of the problem. Um. Craig, we have another chat question. Um, should we be more open on our stocking considerations so that the public understands better how the impacts are scoped? Uh, yeah, I, I think we are with specific interest groups, interest groups currently. Um, you know, if you talk to bass anglers, if you talk to walleye anglers, if you talk to sausage anglers, tiger muskie anglers, hopefully, um, 
we have groups that want them everywhere, right? And we are very open and transparent as to why we can and cannot do things in certain areas, um, usually because of the potential impact to native fishes, but also because of the potential impact to our ability to manage an assemblage of fish in uh, a reservoir, for example, uh, effectively. Um, so we, we work with those particular groups. Uh, we have not probably done a very good job as far as messaging to the general public, our constituency, as far as anglers in general, as far as why we do what we do, where we do. <laughs> right. So. Awesome. Any other questions? Still got a few minutes, so feel free to jump in. There was a, a comment put in there that I think it was Dan that said uh, exactly to Julie saying that the other piece that it's very hard to catch people doing this in the act. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's very hard with our law enforcement personnel that we have in Utah specifically, but elsewhere. Um, you're looking at individuals covering thousands of square miles as far as enforcement. Um, to be honest, on a terrestrial landscape, I view the problem as even more difficult because it is ubiquitous, right? When we have focal areas like reservoirs or rivers, uh, I view it as a little bit easier to attain this. Um, and I think what we need to do is do what they've done on the wildlife setting fairly effectively, which is harness the, the poaching aspect, the poaching hotline aspect of this, but really create something that resonates with our angling community who are the ones that are out there on the ground and don't want to see their, their resources jeopardized by illegal introduction of, of fishes. Um, and, you know, we, we mentioned in the plan changing these poaching hotlines into something that are more like, you know, stop the illegal movement of fish hotlines. I mean, it seems simple, but right now an angler doesn't recognize a poaching hot, hotline as something that they can tap into and use to report a violation of an illegal introduction of a fish. So it's, it's just messaging properly. And I think that that's a subtle tweak that we can do. Peer shaming. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. Other questions or comments? Anybody who's ever actually bird hunted with me will experience peer shaming. So it's okay. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And um, Julie, I, I saw your other question about the surveys. Um, I don't know if you already have Craig's contact information, but maybe that's something you can share. The email. I will I, um, email. I will email what we've got to Julie immediately after this. And oh, that'd uh, be great. Craig. We'll, we'll have some results here coming up in May, I believe, as our preliminary results, and maybe we could sit down and share those. That would be kind of cool. The big one for us is how far are people willing to travel to get X, Y, or Z experience, and we're trying to look at what the radius of influence of a particular water or fishing experience could be, and then how many of those fishing experiences we need to provide in the landscape so people don't try to create their own, so. That's great, great timing. Thanks, Craig. We, we meet with our uh, contractors tomorrow about it to finalize our questions, so awesome timing. Perfect, that is, my wife would not agree with any of that statement at all on many issues, but, you know. <laughs> Great.
Perfect. Okay. Any other questions? It's been a great discussion. Um, all right, I'm not I'm not seeing anything else. So um, might go ahead and close us out here. Uh, so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us. Uh, like we mentioned earlier, this webinar is recorded and we'll make it available on our YouTube channel um, where you can also find uh, all of our other webinars. Um, and Matt, if you don't mind putting that link in the chat, that would be great. If not, I'll do it after. Um, yeah, we also encourage uh, you to visit CCAST and our case study dashboard um, where we currently have 138 case studies. Um, and I will make sure that this recording is up um, at the latest by the end of the day tomorrow. So it should be up there soon. And then next month on April 12th, we're hosting another webinar. Um, this one by Ted Grossholds from US, or UC Davis and Stephanie Green from University of Alberta on the functional eradication of aquatic invasive species. We're always working on lining up more webinar speakers for the coming months. And please contact us if you would like to receive those announcements and are not already on our mailing list. So thank you all for your time today. And thank you again, Craig, for uh, giving this excellent presentation. And we hope you all have a great day.